We have the Certificate of Appreciation. Then we have our lecture by Dr. Salami uh, Olaguki, and I apologize, Dr. Salami, if I'm saying it wrong. And we will have time for question and answers, um, and questions can go into the Zoom chat. Please do keep yourself on mute when not speaking. Um, and a live transcription is available. So if you need that, you can press the more button and request that. Um, briefly, our uh, ISIP mission is to provide a space to connect with people with diverse backgrounds. Mashallah, today we have people joining from all over the world to disseminate knowledge in a free and accessible manner and to develop people's further interests in their personal or professional uh, lives uh, in furthering the field of Islamic uh, psychology and their communities. Uh, as I was mentioning, the ISIP uh, has a YouTube channel. Alhamdulillah, we've been very blessed to have scholars all over the world uh, providing lectures. Uh, they're free, they're available on our YouTube channel, as will this lecture be available, inshallah, um, afterwards. You can also become uh, a member of ISIP, alhamdulillah, we have over uh, 800, 900 people uh, who have become members through our website. Uh, that is www.isip.foundation. Um, Brother Shahzad and Sister Nadira here are co-facilitating, so thank you both to them. And they will be sharing some of the links with us in the chat uh, during the um, lecture as well. Uh, by becoming a member uh, through our website, you will have access to our digital library, uh, which has, alhamdulillah, over a thousand resources already curated on different topics um, related to Islamic psychology. Um, so we'll we'll start, inshallah, with our Fatiha, and then um, we'll introduce our esteemed speaker today. So uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on uh, to bring barakah to our gatherings, to bring healing to the ummah, and to inshallah increase us in all that is khair and beneficial in this life and the hereafter. So with that and all of your beautiful intentions, uh, we start with our fatiha. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman r-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-deen. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نمت عليهم غير المقبوب عليهم ولا الضالين Okay, inshallah. Um, today we have Dr. Salami uh, Mutio Olagoki. Dr. Salami is a doctorate and holder in psychology at the University Pendikan, Sultan Idris, Malaysia. He has a master's in human science in clinical and counseling psychology uh, in 2011 at the International Islamic University of Malaysia, so IIUM. He has a bachelor of science in psychology in 2005 from Nigeria. He is the former coordinator of the Master's in Clinical Psychology program, a joint program between UPSI and USM, and is currently a clinical psychologist specialist attached to the Hospital University SENS in Malaysia. Dr. Salami's doctorate thesis is on integrating Islamic cognitive behavior therapy for depressed patients, and presently is writing a book on psychoreligious functioning of man. So we're looking forward, mashallah, uh, to learning today from Dr. Salami. Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. Uh, Dr. Salami, just on behalf of the ISIP team, we'd like to um, present you this certificate of appreciation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless all of the work that you're doing. And we're very grateful for, um, for you taking the time to be with us and to learn from you today. Thank you so much. Alhamdulillah. All right, so um, we'll be sharing some forms as well. We would appreciate uh, some feedback and uh, please forgive us for any shortcomings and please continue to make dua for us. And just briefly, our next lecture, inshallah, will be with Sheikh Saeed Nasir 
uh, from the UK, an introduction to the ethics of an Islamic therapist. So alhamdulillah, wa shukar Allah, without any further um, delay, I'd like to give the screen and stage to Dr. Salami and Brother Shahzad, you may start sharing the screen as well. You can start, Dr. Salami. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Um, it's, it's a great honor to, to, to be here with the ISIP team and the entire members. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to deliver this topic today. Um, uh, when, the, when, when Brother Jalaluddin contacted me, I did uh, give my approval and I thought of this topic to, to share what I, I know about it. And um, for the fact that I, I come across our noble professor, our noble sheikh, our noble father, Professor Malik Badri. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I was opportune to meet him. I was opportune to learn from him. And um, what I'm sharing today, this very particular topic was actually one of the last concepts he shared with us in the class, the psychotherapy class. Uh, during our master's day in 2008-2009. And uh, when Brother Jalaluddin contacted me, I felt, let me just share this. Alhamdulillah, uh, various topics have been shared over the time since when ISIP started this and even before this time. And um, this particular topic is actually from his uh, knowledge sharing. And even up till today, since when he shared that to us in the class, this was one of his last class he had with us. Because after our class at the time, he did retire from IUA. And um, up till date, in our researchers in, 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 the, in the Western psychology world or researchers in the Muslim psychology world have never dealt into this, or maybe little attention has been paid to this particular concept. I felt, let me just share it among us. Let me see how well we can, and you know, give more credence to it, give more, or a, a kind of shed more light into this particular topic, uh, which we cut across um, the clinical psychology field, the medical field, and and the entire humanity as a whole. Um, yeah, I met I met Prof. Alhamdulillah. I met I met I met our father in, in IUM. Uh, I was with him in the in the last days, actually. Uh, two years ago, by, by now, I guess. Uh, in the pictures, as you can see in the screen, uh, myself and Prof. Ramatulai Khan was with him uh, on, on one of the pictures here. Or maybe I started, I, I start from this particular first slide. Uh, this is one of the conferences we had as far back as 2016, if, I, if I'm right, where we had the, the Association of Muslim Psychologists in the Asian side of the world. Uh, Prof. Malik did spread Islamic psychology more into the Arab and, this, and the Asian continent. With this association, we were able to come together, and uh, the conference was held in IUM at the time. And at another period, while he was in Istanbul, he also made effort to spread Islamic psychology in the axis of, of maybe I say, Central Europe. I, I don't know how to categorize Istanbul, but 
apart from Istanbul and the Turkish Peninsula, it, it extended up to the UK, it extended up to other areas in the European continent. And yeah, before the end of his time, we, we did add a meeting with him, myself and Prof. Ramatula in the other slide. And um, he was still sharing, actually. He was still sharing. And one fundamental thing I could get from, from our father is that, mashallah, whatever he, he teaches you, he, he, it's like you hardly forget. OK? Um, was he sharing things with us in this visit? Was this like two, three months before the, the last days? And um, after this visit, I was also with him again, like a month before his passing. And um, he was still sharing with me. In fact, for the first time, he told me he was in Afghanistan at the time in his life. We were, we were discussing on issues of fiqh, and he was telling me his experiences in Afghanistan. and. I was like, wow, Prof really moved around the world. I mean, despite all his days in the US, in the UK, I was really shocked when he told me he was in Afghanistan. And um, I, I was still listening to him. I was still learning from him, even on FICU issues. And uh, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we, we, we really appreciate Oh, we really appreciated his life with us. We really appreciate everything. I mean, every moment we had with him was much more appreciated. And Alhamdulillah, today we are so proud. We are so happy to, to keep sharing his legacies. And the topic today is just one of those legacies, one of those issues he shared with us in the class. So the mind-body interaction looked like what are we actually talking about? We are looking at the, the unseen part of man and the physical part of man. I mean, looking at this topic, we want to see how does it really apply? But before that, we did talk about some number of issues in Islamic psychology, all right? I define Islamic psychology like this. The religious sector, study of human, spiritual, cognitive, emotion, and behavioral functioning. All right. And looking at this definition, of course, we all got to know that one thing is only added in the spirituality part of human functioning uh, in connection to what we know in our cognition, what we really understand in our emotions and our behavioral dispositions both on daily and every aspect of our human functioning are concerned, okay? There is that connection. I mean, we've been talking about this for, for months, for years now. Uh, another thing we need to also understand is religiosity did predict the spiritual development of human function. Uh, this reason why I put this up is like, looking at literatures generally now, looking at what experts have been writing, looking at what experts in psychology of religion, there is a concept, there is a topic, sorry, there is, there is a course in psychology now, psychology of religion. Uh, experts in this field made a very clear distinction between religiosity and spirituality. It, it's not, it actually it's not adding up. Based on what I've read so far, it's not adding up. You, you cannot differentiate the two as far as Islam is concerned. You cannot give religiosity a particular definition and give spirituality another, due to the fact that as far as Islam is concerned, these two concepts are intertwined, okay? You need to be religious before you can be spiritual. And based on your religious belief, based on your articles of faith, based on what you know as a Muslim, considering the fact that you have certain principles, you have the, the free will to do what you want to do, all right, as human. And at the same time, you get to know that your free will is also limited based on Allah's dictates, based on the Hadith, based on the Sunnah of the Prophet. Okay, when you get that into your your knowledge spectrum, and you are able to understand that fully with, with 
complete faith in Allah with Allah's consciousness, then you can start building up spirituality. And it does not just come up like that. There are certain activities you need to do for spirituality to be, be developed. All right, we are going to look at that also. And the entire thing is actually marked by complete and a sacred belief system. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we look at the, the, the entire comprehension of Islamic faith, which, which starts with believing in Allah, believing in his angels, believing in his messenger. These are all fundamentals. I mean, the day of judgment, how they are well connected to, to our human functioning. I mean, everything actually is completely marked by this, by this system, this belief system. And um, yeah, next slide. And when we look at it from this perspective, we could see that our, our human functioning as a concept is, is highly comprehensive when we looked at it from this particular framework. At the same time, in Islamic psychology, we cannot run out from, from the works of our early Muslim scholars. And it is so obvious that, yeah, we've been hearing this also for some time now. Uh, due to the fact that the concept and the theories we are learning now have actually been developed centuries, years ago, right? I can remember vividly how, how our father came up with one of his last books he wrote. It was in Istanbul. He got the original transcripts, I mean, the original manuscripts from, from the Turkish government to, to translate and write on uh, is the CBT framework of al balki We all know the book, okay? So we are talking about contribution of some early Muslim scholars. They've, they've written on human cognition. They've even written on interventions like CBT, how human cognition and human emotions are intertwined together that it actually influences human behavior. They've talked about all this. Uh, Wolpe did not connect with them. Aaron Beck did not connect with them. I mean, some of our scholars now in the, in the mainstream are not even relating anything to them. Of course, we've had all this. Uh, we've had another aspect of you know, psychological works like classifying okay, psychological disorders, which is also connected to al -Balki. We are talking about, you know, how the DSM come up by the APA from the very first edition up to the current one, without any, you know, connection to what al -Balki has written before and some other scholars. So we, we cannot run away from that history. It's there. And um, efforts are being made to, to, to bring these books into the limelight. Uh, efforts are being geared towards translating some of these books into English language. And um, we could see how, how the works of our scholars previously are really connecting to our present day life, our present day living, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we've learned in the mainstream, of course. Okay. In Islamic psychology also, we need to talk about integration, of course. We need to talk about integration. We have the behaviorist school of thought. We have the cognitive behaviorist school of thought. We have the humanistic. We have the psychoanalysis and everything. And um, as far as scholars currently are concerned, as far as Muslim psychologists are concerned, either at the lecturer level or at the student level, we, we, we can still talk about integration. We need to look at how well can we actually define the belief concept, for instance, of the CBT, all right? In, 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 in our practices, we, we, we can look at the possibility of, okay, if a patient is discussing with you as, as an expert, as a psychologist or a therapist, and this particular patient is looking at the, the possibility of trying to explain why is having some problems and is connecting it to the fact that why he was 
paying five times daily initially, things were really looking okay for him. And currently, due to some activities he's doing, due to some work schedule, and he's finding it difficult to pay as compared to before, things are not really looking out for him. Indirectly, it's letting you know that tactically, he has a commitment to Solat. He has a commitment to Allah, which is not really forthcoming like before. And he's telling you some of this history, telling you some of his occupational history, telling you some of about his school history. And at the same time, he's connecting those issues, those stories to his Islamic personality. That indicates that those kind of patients will be very much interested in exploring what exactly is their religious factor in, in the entire story he's telling us as a patient. So in, in the context of integration, we can, we can look at this area also, as far as Islamic psychology is concerned, either in research or in clinical practice. Um, yeah, one of the major, major proponents of our mainstream psychology is exactly like psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis has been so pronounced, not only even in psychology, the educational field, in sociology, virtually every humanity field, right? And um, it's always very nice for us to get a complete understanding of what this psychoanalysis really look like uh, in terms of both rational, spiritual, and scientific forms. Of course, some, some experts have really criticized some of these areas in psychoanalysis that is unscientific. Uh, is some, of the, some of the ideas, the concepts are not empirically proven. Uh, Prof. Malik did share with us some of, some of these issues. He asked us to even read certain books from the library. Uh, but I will not deal much on this because of time. Likewise, we look at paranormal psychosis. I recently attended a conference in Jeddah, and um, this is a psychiatric conference, actually. And um, why many of the presenters were like sharing topics on certain medications, certain psychotropic drugs, antidepressant, antipsychotic drugs, and I mean, the conference is majorly for psychiatrists. I was I was actually there. Uh, based on invitation anyway. I was so amazed when one scholar, I mean, one doctor came in from uh, the Saudi Arabian branch, I think somewhere in, is it Jeddah or Riyadh? Riyadh. Uh, John Hopkins has a campus in Riyadh and he's actually working there. And he shared this topic. It was mind blowing, paranormal psychosis. He was giving us the, the clear indication, the clear path between gene possession and all those stuff relating to the, the spiritual world of, of human functioning. He's telling us about what is going on within the gene world and is connecting it to clinical psychology, is connecting it to concepts like schizophrenia. And it was making us understand that, yes, in between the symptoms of schizophrenia and the symptoms of somebody who is possessed by the gene are very, very similar, considering the fact that, yes, both sides of the spectrum, in terms of the symptoms, can very much connect into uh, inappropriate speech, hallucinations, delusions. So we, we now look. We now need to look into the, to the differential diagnosis of, okay, what is going to actually make somebody to be diagnosed of catatonic schizophrenia at the same time, when he or she is also disposing and exhibiting symptoms connecting to a gene-possessed person. So we, we looked at this differential diagnosis. It was sharing, actually. And when it got to the intervention part also, uh, if the person is being diagnosed of, of gene possession actually, and, and you as a clinical psychology or as a psychiatrist, you want to come up with any treatment plan or intervention for this kind of person, it's, it's virtually difficult because in this area, we need something like an 
like an integration of both credible Islamic scholars and clinical psychologists or psychiatrists coming together to make this intervention work because there are some spiritual dimension to how those intervention can actually be done. So he was, he was bringing in this area and it's, it's really, really amazing to listen to. I was really happy to hear that. And I was really happy to be in the conference to, to, to witness that presentation. It was really mind blowing. I see this area as, wow, another, another big area for, for, for clinical psychologists, for psychiatrists, for Islamic scholars. I'm talking about credible Islamic scholars who knows really, really about this. I mean, about these issues. So that's, that's another area. That's another area. Next slide, please. Okay, looking at the topic for today, um, we'll, be, we'll be looking at some dimensions. I, I broke it down into dimensions actually. And um, yeah, next slides. The first one is the scientific dimension, okay? I don't know if any of us have heard about the concept called the placebo. This is very much linked to the medical student, I mean, those in the medical areas or scientist areas. I'm not sure exactly, but more of medical. Um, this was one of the areas Prof did share with us. May Allah have mercy on his soul. While we are trying to look at, okay, how do we even explain the spiritual dimension of man? to the mainstream psychologist. How do we explain? Yes, due to empirism factors, we are not going to get our papers published in these big journals. Yes, due to you know, objectivity or whatever factors in the science model, we are not going to get our way in explaining this. It's, it's never going to be, I mean, possible. Because what we are trying to talk about here cannot be measured with physical whatever. So. But how do we explain, at least for explanation's sake, that there is an aspect of human functioning that is not physical, that we cannot measure, okay? So he came up with this concept. He gave us, he gave us some materials to read on. We made a photocopy of that material, not the entire textbook, a photocopy of the material. I can't even find any of it anymore. But I did some research and I want to understand it fully after the class. It is called the placebo effect. The placebo effect works like this. There was, there was a research as far back as 1960, because this is an area that is not even being addressed. Maybe faintly, I cannot say anymore, I'm not sure, so I cannot say anymore, but it's not being given attention presently due to certain factors. It gave us, an illustration of a research study, an experimental study that was conducted by a researcher at the time. Okay, we have the experimental group, we have the control group. Okay, and um, for the experimental group, these subjects, these subjects were gathered together. I mean, they were they were passing through this experiment in order to treat a particular illness. Let's assume something like headache. Right, and there is this capsule, this capsule that involves a powder inside. We know the capsule drug, right? In most cases, of course, it's being filled with a powder. So now the capsule is to treat the headache. Now, these capsules were given to the participant, to the subject in the experimental group. And they were to take these drugs for three days, right? For the control group, they were being given an empty capsule, okay, without the powder inside. Mind you, the content inside this capsule, I mean, the powder content is actually the, the, the medication we are talking about to treat the illness, right? So, but the control group was given the placebo. The placebo is the empty capsule. Now, after three days, the experimental group were taking the doses, 
every day, three times, I mean, three times a day's dose, for the fourth day, the second day, the third day. And after a week of assessment, all the groups, both those in the experimental group and those in the control group got cured. I mean, those in the experimental group actually took the drug. Those in the control group who took the placebo were actually being made to understand they're also taking the drug to treat the same illness like those in the experimental group. And after one week of assessment, I mean, after one week of results, they were both cured. So there was no difference in terms of the effects of the drug. Meaning that those in the control group who took the empty capsule had the belief that they are actually taking the capsule, they are actually taking the medication that led to the cure of what they were experiencing. I don't know if we're getting the point here. This is the placebo, all right? And in the medical field, in the medical research, it's actually regarded as contentious, even up, up to this moment. It did challenge the biological and the scientific basis of the medical practice, according to this guy in 2008. Yeah, that's the, that's the situation of the placebo. I think we need to read more of this. We need to read more of this and get to know that something within the human functioning that is making somebody's belief to make an effect on the physiological or the physical aspect of man to work out something. Because looking at it, it's much more obvious that those given the placebo actually were not, actually, were not taking the drug. So this, this is how it works, all right? The research of this was done at the time. And um, that's just one aspect of what we are trying to look at here. Next slide. And then we could see that, yes, Scientifically, something can be proven. There's this article from, from Tistrom in, in 2008. We need to have a look at it and, and read it up. It's quite interesting. It's quite amazing for us to know what the placebo really means, what the placebo really means. All right, next slide. Um, we have the physical dimension, okay, which is very much connecting to the fact that the mind-body interaction is really explain, all right? I don't know if any of us have heard of the word pseudocysis, kind of a pseudo-pregnancy thing. This is becoming another dimension for us to understand the fact that, yes, there is always a connection between that unseen, let me use the word unseen aspect of humans, and the physical, the seen aspect of humans, which is our body, the mind is actually being connected to the body. Something is working there. You need to really understand. And physically, there is this issue happening among women. Okay? Yeah, it's really happening among women. And why Prof was sharing this with us, he gave us the case study of a woman in Sudan at the time. All right? Um, a woman who is like very much interested to become pregnant after, after, after matrimony, just like any other woman. And the belief is so strong, the enthusiasm is so strong to the extent that it's, she started exhibiting pregnancy symptoms, all right? And um, the symptoms becoming so obvious, the stomach started shooting up, she started in fact, she lost her menses, all right? The menses stopped, the menses ceased, and the body started reacting to the fact that, yes, there is a pregnancy. But in the real fact, the, the, the futures, or what do we call it, is not there, right? Yeah. And after some number of pregnancy tests, I mean, Tests were done to confirm that there was no pregnancy. She's still like, you know, making it clear to herself that no, there is a baby in there. We're talking about moms, all right? 
We are talking about months. Prof did share this with us as far back as 2009 in Sudan, while he was still having patients years back. So we are talking about 1980s, all right? So when I left IUM, I came to my current university. There is a new case, all right? Another case. So we are talking about how it has been happening to women across the globe. All right, the next slide. We did have a patient here in Malaysia also. Same symptoms, same scenario. And I tried finding out some other issues relating to this. It's even in YouTube. There are, there are some women, I think, from the US, I guess, in YouTube that are also experiencing this. We can have the watch in, I mean, we can have the watch on YouTube on this. It's really happening, right? And um, we are talking about where if it's actually related to an intense desire to become pregnant. And according to experts, it affects the endocrine system, which in turn causes symptoms of pregnancy. So yeah, I've highlighted cases in Sudan and Malaysia. Uh, from my search again, as far back as 2011, I mean, sorry, just last year, currently, there's another case, these guys wrote this article in, in, in Zimbabwe just last year. By some hours time, maybe it's going to be two years ago, anyway. So yeah, there's another case in Zimbabwe last year, All right? Next slide, we can have a look at this article also. Uh, to confirm this, yeah, hope or desperation, pseudocysts in advance, arteriology in a woman with recurrent miscarriages. Yeah, we can have a, we can have a look at this article. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay, so now we go to the spiritual dimension. I, I, I bring this last to, I mean, to, to the last part of the dimensions. So we can, we can have a clearer picture of what we're actually looking at here. Uh, I'll be taking the soul, the mind, and the heart interchangeably. I mean, no much time to, to be looking at, okay, what exactly is the soul? What exactly is the mind? What exactly is the heart? Uh, for the heart, of course, we have the physical dimension of it. Our, our physical heart is there that is pumping our blood and uh, but as far as the Quran and the Prophet Sadi is concerned, we have the spiritual dimension of everything here. So we're looking at them interchangeably, right? Um, in one of the ideas reported by Abu Rera of a servant who commits a sin and a black man appears upon his heart. That's how this is indicating something that the more somebody commits a wrongdoing, a sin, there's a black dot there, all right? And when it gets to a particular stage, the black dot continues to add up and the person's heart becomes, I mean, totally black, all right? So we'll look at that in a much more clearer picture later. Uh, when we... I will look at Surah to Yusuf in verse 53, where Almighty Allah said, in that our soul is actually prone to always, you know, commit something that is indecent, that is evil. So it, it did make it very clear to, to, to us that, of course, we are not angels our soul, which is that spiritual aspect of our functioning, is prone to committing evil, is prone to committing any acts, maladaptive, anything. We are really prone to that. So we need to understand this also. We need to understand this, all right? Uh, next slide, please. We need to understand this. So in the course of while we are trying to you know, engage in anything we are doing, all right? There's always the inner struggle dimension we also need to understand, okay? For instance, now, we, 
we're always having a motivation to do something. We're always having a motive. We're always having an intention to do something. We're always having this, you know, issue in our mind. We, we, we have it in form of messages. We have it in form of whisperings, all right? We have the conscience telling us to do what is good. We have another aspect of our mind telling us to commit evil. So what happened is we keep having this inner struggle, just like how we are in solar. And you, you want to concentrate, but something is taking you out of that solat. Physically, you are there, you are hearing the recitation from the man, but your mind is away and you want to bring it back. So you always struggle, right? Likewise, in our daily function, we always struggle. How? What happens eventually will be that is either we, we find ourselves in a position of being in control or we're always being controlled. Or sometimes we're always being controlled. Sometimes we're always in control, something like this. So I put this in opposite direction, all right? And um, yeah, the, the battle we keep like that until the end of our time on earth is going to be like that. And um, it now depends on our choice. That's how free will comes in. We need to choose where we belong because Internally, before we do any act, something is pushing us to do, something is pushing us not to do, all right? So it, it all depends on our choice, it all depends on our decision making. Where do we always fall into? Okay, next slide. So when controlled, I mean, we're always been given to, 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 to the evil side of things, I mean, to the wrongdoing side of things. And um, I see it like this, that our nafsul amara is activated at that time, okay? Um, this is a kind of soul that is, you know, very much interested, very much enjoying to commit something wrong, all right? Uh, emotions in control of functioning at this time, yes. I bring in this as a point to note, even as, as easy as how we eat. People binge eat due to, due to certain factors, right? Uh, you eat when you are not even hungry, right? And you allow your emotions to, to take you to the level of just eating and eating, some we claim, okay, we are, we are only just using it to, to cope with stressful situations, fine. But at the same time, when you keep eating and eating and eating at will, due to choice, due to, due to emotions, because you enjoy that eating, eventually it's going to get to a level at which when it's not controlled, it, it leads to a kind of increase in weight, all right? And when you notice that, after a period of time, you notice that, oh, you, you are now getting interested to, to see how your weight looks like. Okay, start checking up with the measurement. And you are getting to the borderline of, you know, being becoming an obese person. And that keeps worrying, and, all right? And after some time, the measurement is telling you you're already obese and you are getting worried. You get into the Google search, oh, what's obesity all about? And obesity is going to lead to this. You've got to see the doctor. The doctor is advising you to take it slowly up to the extent of maybe it needs you to start doing some exercise, try to reduce your calories and all those stuff. And the fearful part comes in. And that's why I call it like binge eating stress, vicious flow. It's more like just as a result of the fact that you don't even control your emotions, you get to the level at which it becomes stressful because either you go to search or the doctor tells you that becoming obese leads to diabetes, it leads to all sorts of medical conditions. It becomes stressful because of that. All right? And that stress, again, if not properly managed, we also put you to keep eating according to what some people claim to do with food. So it's like a vicious flow out of as a result of the fact that 
We couldn't even control how we eat and the reason why we are eating. So it applies to other kind of our daily functioning, other aspects of our life. All right. Uh, just like they are this I just quoted, the heart becomes filled with the black dots. Because another aspect of what we are doing as humans, your mind is telling you to do certain things that is not good for you as humans. And you couldn't control that, and the body reacts. Yeah, the body reacts. Same thing goes to, to, to those who, who take to surgery. I mean, they take to surgery to take out body fats, all right? And, and this surgery is not something so easy, but it becomes very difficult when the, the, the experts, the surgeons and the doctors are telling you that after they've taken out the body fat, your stomach is going to be sealed up Right, I've forgotten the procedures. Your stomach is going to be sealed up, indicating that how you cope with this means you only just need to take a glass of juice, just take like two, three spoons of rice, and just take one aspect of the chicken if there's anyone there, and that's it. Because your stomach has been sealed up, you're not going to take much more than that. So while you're in social gatherings, while everybody's eating the way they want, you cannot do that. So by default, if you think you are free to do whatever you like, you always listen to what your mind is telling you to do whatever you like. At a particular point in time, that freedom is going to be limited because there is always that interaction. The whole thing starts from what comes in from your mind. What's, what's your mind telling you? What's your heart telling you? What's your soul telling you before you act, all right? Uh, and certain individuals, to some, to some people, when it becomes habit, habits becomes addictions. When it gets to a particular level, addiction becomes pathological. How do you see that? All right? And we, we, we have some number of psychological disorders, even according to the DSM, indicating something like this. When you look at psychopaths, you look at sociopaths, they did start from somewhere, right? And, and I guess a particular level when things are not going to add up anymore. Yeah, to take months of rehab. Okay, that can be very painful, right? Next slide. Um, now, when in control, Nerve labuama is activated. Uh, this, this is a nerve that we are talking about initially, the struggle. You are always in, in that aspect of, you know, struggling to make things right. That's mind, that aspect of your soul telling you to, to, to do something wrong will surely be there, but you're always in that constant fight. You're always in that constant struggle to make things right. Yes, while in solar, you continue to witness, you continue to experience the mind going away. In fact, that's at the time when I was even trying to write up this slide. Some of the points you are seeing on the screen came from while I was in solar. How do we address that? Yes. I don't know how many people is experiencing this, but I'm just telling you my own recent experience. How do we address that? Some of the points you are seeing on the screen came to me while I was in Salah. So we keep fighting. We just have to keep fighting. We have to keep renewing our intention. We have to make sure that things are put in the proper place inside. Because the forces are always there. It now depends on where do we belong how do we choose where we belong? It all boils down to us in terms of how we decide to follow which aspects we are following, all right? We talked about the psycho-spiritual strength that connects our cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functioning, okay? Because the nerves of Lavuama will always put you on that track, yes. You're always in the, in the, in the fight to make sure that yes, things are done correctly. You're always in the fight to make sure that your mind is always back to the solar. 
All right, we are going to the pool where you, or maybe you are going to the sujud, where you are about doing the, 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 the sitting, or where you are about standing up, you just have to get back connected to the solar, right? Um, but it's not just coming that easy, it's, it's as a result of your own effort, right? So whoever is being able to like, being able to get this done for a certain period of time, yeah. There is this accumulated strength that helps us to withstand difficult times when they come. Because at the spiritual level, you're always making sure you do things rightly. Yeah. You have a target of reciting some portions of the Holy Quran for maybe like five pages, 10 pages, or sometimes a juice per day, or depending on your plan. Your, your mind is fighting for you to do it. It's not that easy, either as a student or as a worker or whoever you have. It's not that easy. Even if you have all the free time in the world, it's not that easy to do all this, right? And um, you always want to fight to do that. And what that accrued to is a particular strength. You have this strength that even when challenges come, difficult times come, you will be okay. It will be easier for you to allow patients to come in. It will be easier for you to you know, go through the perseverance, go through the pain. It will be better for you to, because you already have a backdrop. You, I mean, sorry, you already have a, a back strength, accumulated ones when things were okay, all right? And when difficult time comes, you already have something like a shock absorber to, to, to put you on track, all right? Something like that. Uh, if you look at the hadith reported by Abu Dal, it's very much in Sahib Buhari. We have this hadith where uh, one of the hadiths uh, uh, that is narrated by Allah, but the Prophet, I mean, the Prophet made it open to the servants anyway. So we, we all know this hadith where Allah says, if it comes to me walking, I come running. That's, that's a spiritual statement. It's, it's not physical. Spiritual statement in the sense that at a particular time when you, 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 you find yourself in this struggling and making things right and always on the better side internally, and of course, you are always being backed up with the, the adaptive behaviors, adaptive functioning, either spiritually or in your workplace, all right, everything is moving fine, okay? So at a particular time, you are going to attain this level. Some are attaining this level, yeah, of spirituality. And another thing again is, um, we're always talking about this verse also in Surah Al-Anqbal, verse two. Ayatu Zanatum Imana. Wala Lara Pim Tawak. Wala Pim Yatawak Talum. So when we say that when the, 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 the servant of Allah have this constant remembrance, he has this Allah's consciousness every time, he is going to have that satisfaction. The satisfaction is the main point we are looking here. The satisfaction is very much connecting to those who are always being mindful of Allah's presence. We are talking about Allah's consciousness. We are talking about before they do anything, Allah's picture is in their mind. After they are doing something, Allah's picture is in their mind. On their daily functioning from morning to night, they, they exhibit every aspect by what the prophet has taught them, every aspect of their daily function. Either while walking on the road, they are always on the right side. Before looking at the mirror, they said their prayers. Of course, the simple ones before eating, they said their prayers, all right? Even while wearing their shoes, they put on the right leg for the left leg. 
I mean, all this, either simple or not simple, they are always in that constant reminder of, yes, Allah is seeing me, whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to do this to please him. I'm trying to do this to safeguard myself. Everything is being connecting to you from the spiritual realm of, you know, Islamic principles and, yeah, what have you. So that, that constant remembrance of Allah brings in this satisfaction. That satisfaction is what we are looking at here in the next slide, please. That satisfaction is never, never easy to come by. It breeds contentment, it breeds mastery, it breeds prosocial behavior. Even though you don't have that means, all right? You are not a rich person, but you are sacrificing your time, you are sacrificing your little money to those who are in need. This is priceless. It's not happening that easy. It comes from those who are really, really in constant remembrance of Allah, who are living their life within the vicinity of Allah's consciousness, who are living their life within the dictates of Sunnah, who are living their life within the, within the spectrum of what is right, all right? According to the Sunnah, according to the Hadith, they are always watchful, right? So when we are connecting satisfaction to remembrance of Allah, we are talking about the satisfaction that comes with contentment. Whatever little you have, you are so happy, you are like the richest man in the world. Because even the richest man in the world is not contented. He keeps looking for more. That's for fact. Yes. So the issue is that that satisfaction breeds Mastery as students, you you just come to realize. I don't know. I don't know if it applies to to others. I don't know if it applies to you. It is only when I'm fasting, either Monday or Thursday, I get things done so easily. It's like the brain is working more sharply when we are fasting. I'm yet to conduct any research for that to prove that, but I've read some articles that is connecting this and this together. But practically, I'm trying to understand various times when I'm fasting in out these days. I mean, during this period in the office, even as a student, I read an article, I've been able to like analyze it easily. I, I, I just think so, you know, easily and with some kind of happiness because things keep flowing. So we are talking about mastery here. In whatever you are doing, you know, you, you, you need to connect to, to, to something like this. You are, you are putting in your best performance at this period. You are, you are putting in certain number of issues that, you know, puts you in the limelight, which ordinarily others may find difficult to do. So, like I said, there are various aspects of prosocial behavior that also is being breeded by, by, by satisfaction. All right, we can look at the story of Abu Bakr and Umar. Yes, these are not angels. They are not angels. They donated everything. Umar came with half of his wealth. All right, and Abu Bakr also came with the entire wealth, his entire house, everything. They are not angels. They also have blood in their vein, like us. Yes. But the fact that these individuals have high level of satisfaction with whatever they are doing, their contentment is very solid. They, 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 get, they get the message very, very correctly and they are acting by it. I mean, it's, it's very much an obvious fact that remembrance of Allah takes a lot, you know? to put us on the right track, to make us understand the fact that, yes, uh, this, this spirituality factor applies to the fact that, yes, always being in the constant of a last remembrance in whatever we do, both in spirit and in practice, we, we get the benefits, we get the benefits, right? And it's not only, 
you know, giving us those cognitive or emotional satisfaction. It's also giving us the practical ones in terms of mastery, in terms of social behaviors, all right? Uh, we also look at Zikri and Dua. I mean, considering the fact that, yes, uh, they, have, they have their connection to our functioning, our daily functioning. I've mentioned part of them before. We also need to look at that. We also need to look at that. All right, next slide, please. All right, I came with this implication for practice for we Muslims or Muslim psychologists, either as students or as practitioners. Um, we need to start looking for religious history based on patients' consents. All right? We need to start looking at that. I mean, those of us in the practice sector. Because when a patient is talking to us, and we only just want to like hold on to, okay, you have the family history, you have the school history, you have the medical history. Of course, we are not trained to, to, to look out for the religious history, even though the patient is giving us some indications that this is the kind of person I am. I've been doing this before, but due to my work and some other tight schedule I have, I've not been able to do this. And, and it's indicated to certain religious practices, which he believes or which he feels that might be a factor to what's happening to him. But as, as experts, as Muslim experts, we need to explore that. We need to really explore that. Of course, getting the consent of the patient to, to do that also matters, right? We need to start thinking of integrating Islamic principles. We've been hearing about this. What principles are we going to integrate? Which, which concept are we going to integrate to? We need to look at how our belief structures will be integrated into therapy, right? And um, as Muslims, we may feel this is quite difficult, but yet it's, it's practicable, right? It's really practicable. Um, we may be very much connecting to the fact that, yes, the behavioral school is telling us to focus on systematic desensitization, uh, cooking economy and all of that view. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is also there. We are very much connecting to the fact that yes, talked about cognitive restructuring and what have you and everything relating to that. But at the same time, we, we, we need to explore the fact that certain patients we need the concept of Tawakul, for instance, concept of aqua, for instance, all right? And how does that apply? For instance, now let's look at another area of homework, okay? Another area of homework, we want to make sure our patient is very much connecting to his Islamic practice wants to be much more spiritual. He wants to be much more religious, okay? We can, we can make it very clear, okay? Why can't you exhibit certain number of, apart from your salat, apart from your five daily salat, these particular practices on a daily basis will make you be much more connected to, to a last consciousness. We make you much more connected to a last remembrance, for instance. Whether you're in the workplace or you're in the school, you are, you are in your classes, okay, wherever you are, this acts may put you much more in, in, in the spectrum of a last member. So you don't easily get detached, all right? So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, like that, you are a light. Which one have you been able to do? Which one did you miss? So after the following week, we, we can examine that and see how well, because for the fact, these practices breeds remembrance, breeds consciousness of Allah, and eventually is going to, you know, make him feel better. It's going to make him like, if he's really sincere of what he's doing anyway. So we need to start talking about integrating. We've been doing that for some time. We need to, we need to put up that also. 
We need to be open to knowledge in the ocean of man's psychospiritual functioning. Yeah, I talked about the, the, the paranormal psychosis just now, and um, it's really mind blowing. I mean, some of us may not really have a, a depth idea of what that means. We might have watched some movies in terms of exorcism, all right, uh, being displayed by, by other religions in, in those movies. But at the same time, we have the, we have the Islamic practice concerning that. On, on what dimension should we focus on, you know, how does it work? Who are the specialists that can do it? How is it connecting to mental disorders, for instance? On what platform can we say that, okay, this particular patient is either being gene possessed or is suffering from catatonic schizophrenia, for instance? So we need to start looking at how can two experts, three experts come together, including an Islamic specialist, if if can call it that name, or an Ustaz, can be part of this team to engage in a collaborative differential diagnosis, something like this. We need to start thinking about that. Because for, for fact, for real, we have we have across the globe, across various cultures, genes are real. They are getting into humans, and some people are paying the price, right? So we, we just need to understand that fact that, yes, this, this is a problem among we Muslims, which we need to handle, right? Um, next slide, please. OK. Still on that practice, we have. This pattern of therapeutic framework, we also need to imbibe into our practice and also getting to understand the pattern. Uh, Prof, may Allah have mercy on his soul, we keep praying for him. Share with us how a patient who is having an OCD, right? OCD, OCD in terms of Deaths on the hand, right? And he keeps cleaning, he keeps taking his baths, okay? But painfully, when he gets to the masjid, he keeps performing ablution until the entire salat is being done, all right? So this is the case profile of this patient. So it's so painful that he goes to the masjid, he loses all the prayer and he gets eventually to pray by himself after people have started even going in. So Prof shared with us how he, he, he helped this patient. And uh, at that period, Ramadan is getting close. Let's look at the pattern now. Ramadan is getting close. And he waited for Ramadan to start. And this particular patient was taken to Tarawi. Right? So we are talking about systematic desensitization here, and we are talking about gradual exposition here, right? Because Prof is a behaviorist by, by mainstream. Yeah, it's a behaviorist. So we talked about systematic desensitization, we talked about gradual, graduality and what have you. So, and it worked, it worked. Mashallah, it worked. So what happened is, why? He is being listening to the Quranic recitation going on from the Imam. Yeah, he lost the first solar. I mean, he lost the first raka, he lost the second raka after the slim. He, he lost the third, according to him, on the first day. And he did lose the fourth also. But he was able to meet up with the fifth. So that gave some relief. So after the following week, he lost another two rakats. After the third week, he was able to cope with the entire salat, with the entire tarawih prayers. He performs his wudu because the problem is while he's performing the wudu, he wants to start again. He performs the wudu, he gets to a particular point, he starts again and wash the hand and start again like that. So he, he made use of the tarawih sections to help the patient to understand the fact that yes, you may be losing the, the raka, but after some time, you, 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 you can get it done and meet up with the entire solat. 
based on that process. So we just need to figure out how do we help patients with this kind of problem, All right? This is just a tip. Um, also, we need to look at therapist-client relationship and the ethical considerations involved. Um, uh, for some of us who are like experts in, in, in the field of helping professionals, we, we need to be much more humane, all right? Looking at, looking at our, our, our religious scripts, we can understand the fact that, yes, while we are addressing to patients, we are attending to patients, sorry, we, we need to be much more humane. Uh, asking questions like, how can I help you? Does not sound good as a helping professional. I don't understand if, what, if you understand what I'm trying to say. You are meeting someone for the first time or a patient walks into your office. This patient is already there to seek for your help, right? So asking this kind of questions is putting you much more in an authority figure. Yes, you are a specialist. You are the authority figure, no problem. But sometimes we need to understand the fact that, yes, some of these patients have feelings. They need much more humane interaction, right? So asking those kind of questions can be irritating to some. I mean, and um, we need to start understanding the fact that, yes, our relationship with the patient shouldn't be that maybe too official or I don't know. I don't know how to target, but we need to start understanding that, yes, I'm here to listen to you. I'm very much okay hearing your stories, something like that. We make it much more humane. We are actually there for the patient. Okay, so we need to understand this also in terms of practice. We also need to adopt some kind of religious history I, I discussed earlier on. Yeah, we need to start exploring. We need to start exploring, all right? And not just being uh, constantly fixed with the mainstream we've learned in the classes, uh, we, we've learned in, 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 in our practices, in our various uh, internship, whatever. We need to start looking at how do we get the religious history of our patient when the patient has been revealing things relating to his religiosity. Of course, before we go into this, the informed consent will have been able to be very clear between both of us, right? So patients will tell you, Muslim patients, of course, will tell you that this is what I've been doing. And from their stories, they let us know. So when you get those hints, you explore. That's just it. All right, next slide. Also, in terms of research, we, we can also explore the, the area of Kushu in Salat, okay? This is a constant problem. And it's going, to be a, it's going to remain a constant problem until the end of time. But how do we start looking at ways and means in terms of research to help Muslims, general Muslim population, to, to reduce it, to reduce our mind going away from the Salat? Yeah, this has been a very touching area I have been thinking on. Recently, a PhD student is interested in doing this research, and we are still looking up to it. We need to really collaborate with, with experts. We need to collaborate with scholars in, in the masjid. Uh, some years ago, I think before the COVID, yeah, before the COVID, a, a, a professor in Malaysia yeah, did a, uh, a research in the mosque, right? I don't know your communities, but here in Malaysia, people are much more free talking to the imam, talking to the ustaz in the mosque. They, they share their feelings, they share their issues with the ustaz. And this professor was able to explore that. He trained the ustaz on, on Islamic counseling and what have you. And when the, 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 the research was about to commence, he, he did make it very known to, to, the, to the participants. I'm talking about some number of addicts here. And an intervention was done in the mosque, right? This, this is a research. 
This is where the patients feel much more free to express themselves based on a group therapy session and, and it was quite effective. So there are a number of things we can do. There are a number of things we can do as far as Islamic psychology is concerned, as far as exploring these areas. Uh, maybe I would like to stop here. I don't know if there are questions. Jazakallah khairan, kathiran, Dr. Salami, mashallah. This has been a fascinating topic and a really important one as well. Um, I really liked uh, how you started and just centering us on the placebo effect and understanding like the power of our beliefs to really uh, be integrated into our complete healing, subhanAllah. So definitely uh, a lot to think about and thank you for inspiring us. Alhamdulillah, wa shukur Allah. So thank you so much and appreciation from all of us at ISIP and all the attendees here. We do have some questions. I am mindful of your time, Dr. Salami, but uh, with your permission, if we could ask a, a few of the questions that have come in. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, all right, inshallah. So our first question is um, on the paranormal psychosis. Um, this is from Brother Amir. Um, if Rukia is not working and the patient is uncured for a number of years, can the psychologist see the jinn, for example, tie him, seize him, drive him away by, for by force to cure the patient? And if not, how can the psychologist get over his or her own helplessness in curing a patient? Wow, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, in the first place, how was this patient diagnosed to be a gene possessed person? Right. All right. That's that's one big issue we need to understand in this area. Um like I said, like I said, there's a thin line in diagnosing that, okay, this person is gene possessed or this person is suffering from schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is the nearest psychological disorder listed in DSM-5 uh, that is connecting to gene possession symptoms, all right? And um, like I said earlier on also, it takes, it takes, not just one expert here. Right. Yeah, we need a clinical psychologist for sure. We need not just an Islamic scholar, we need a specialized kind of Islamic scholar in this area. Right. Because reading the Rukia also itself calls for some spiritual connected ustaz or person. Right. Maybe I don't use the word ustaz anymore a spiritually connected person, individual, who has that strength to read the Rukia in order to exercise this gene out of the human. We've seen some number of them. We have some numbers of, of this in Nigeria. We have also here in Malaysia. Yeah. So whoever is actually conducting this particular Rukia needs to actually assess itself. I mean, it's not just somebody opening up the books or memorizing the Rukia itself and reading right. it. Yeah, that's that's what it takes. So I, I cannot really answer this question on right. the basis that what actually causes the diagnosis of this gene possession in the first place. We need to actually right. understand that if actually this person is really being gene possessed or is suffering from a disorder completely. So, right. yeah. Yeah, so it's more of a case-by-case case and an integrative approach with multiple um, kind of experts looking at it. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Dr. absolutely. Right. Okay, um, Sister Nadira has a question. Um, how can we differentiate the physical sickness because of stress or trauma with an actual physical problem, for example? When someone has trouble breathing, how does one know that 
the, the the breathing problem is because of the stress or is there a real physical issue? Breathing or difficulty breathing here. Maybe I, maybe maybe connecting to certain medical conditions. Mm. Right? There are some number of medical conditions that can that can trigger difficulty in breathing. It's a physiological thing. And um, yeah, that's that's very much a, a question for the medical practitioners to answer. Mm. At the same time, at the same time, it may be a it may be connecting to stress, like like how the question comes in. If it's connecting to stress, I mean, we need to also examine what is the what is the history of this person. Has he been having this issue before? Um, what, what kind of activity or she is engaging in to be this stressful to experience difficulty breathing? We need to also look at that. But for the fact that breathing difficulty is very much a physiological thing, I think in most cases it's always ascribed to a medical issue. Now, if it's psychological, uh, as far as I know, possibly maybe a panic-related problem may lead to difficulty breathing. Now, right. if this person is having a kind of panic attack, right? right or like you said, it's very much more like a trauma-related problem, okay? So it calls for a proper assessment to be done by a clinical psychologist before a diagnosis can, can be attained, right? So it's possible trauma can lead to difficulty breathing, but right. mind you, before you can diagnose somebody of maybe PTSD, there are certain criteria you also need to look at. Before you can diagnose someone of panic attack or panic disorder, there are some number of criteria you need to look at. You need to also understand the number of symptoms, how many periods it has been affecting this person, I mean, how many months, yeah. Has right. that been affecting normal daily functioning? We need to look at that. Is it connecting to uh, substance abuse? Is it connecting to any medical condition? We also need right. to look at all that, right? Yeah. So yeah, there are some number of factors surrounding breathing difficulty. Yes, right? thank you so much, yeah. And I, I, I think, yeah, exactly. Like these, these types of questions, they always require, um, more tracking, gathering more information, trying to develop patterns, as you were mentioning, like how what how long is this happening? How how often is it happening? What is happening before, perhaps what is happening afterwards to collect all of that information? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually had a question as well, uh, Dr. Salami. Um, in our language, or at least in the English language, there's sayings such as, like, I knew this in my gut, or, you know, and they're referring to like the stomach. And also in the, the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he says, Istafta qalbik, yani ask your heart or consult your heart. Um, I'm wondering how we can develop that um, ability to become more in tune with what our heart, for example, is telling us. So when the Prophet وسلم, says, take that, you know, istafta qalbik, take that consultation, take that fatwa from your heart. And uh, oftentimes we're so disconnected to our heart or so disconnected with our bodies, we don't even realize what our bodies may be telling us. So how how can we become more in tune uh, with that? Okay. Um, yeah, looking at that, this getting to listen to your heart, right? Um, it's quite a difficult thing to do, but at the same time, we need to be very clear of what exact or what exactly is our heart telling us under the platform that is this something that is coming out of a wish? We need to differentiate now. Is it something coming out of a wish in our mind? something we, we are interested in, something we've been thinking about, or yeah. 
is coming out of our own uh, whims, mm. all right? As humans, we have all sorts of, you know, aspirations and um, we have sort of some kind of plans. We, we want certain number of things in life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, irrespective of whatever kind of person you are, we do have all this, okay? At the same time, we need to understand what exactly is, like you said, in the ideas, it's our heart telling us. Yes, like I said earlier on, we have that aspect. Maybe we connect this heart you are talking about to conscience, right? Um, irrespective of whatever is coming into our heart, whatever is coming into our mind, we always have the good side, which sounds like, you know, that moral agent. Mm -hmm. Okay, we serve like that moral agent that tells us what to do in terms of righteousness. It tells us what is right, okay? It always reminds us of what is right. At the same time, we have the other side of it. So the, the, the situation is, what exactly are we talking about here? And um, sometimes if you observe vividly, I don't know for, 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 for everyone, what your mind is always pushing that you want to do, you really wish for yourself. Mind you, sometimes we see it in the dreams. Mm. How do we explain that? Okay, so now when sometimes we see this in the dreams, it becomes something even much more serious in our consciousness, right? We, we've, we've had it from the heart, we've had it from our mind so much more that we want it, Right. Eventually, we start dreaming about it, yeah. and it automatically becomes something really meaningful to us. But at the same time, we need to be very careful that, okay, yeah, this is as a result of my own wishful thinking. It's my own wishful mindfulness, something oh, like right. that. So right. we, we need to be very clear. We need to be very clear because at the same time, that heart tells us what is not good for us the same heart-mind spectrum. So, right. yeah, something like that. I don't know if I'm able to answer the question, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I definitely appreciate the discussion. And, and sometimes, you know, we're, we need that extra uh, voice and to consult with, you know, someone because it's hard, as you said, if it's our, just our own whims, sometimes we're blinded that, is this my own whim and seeking, you know, consultation with a sheikh or with a trusted uh, companion or, or with even, um, you know, someone who may know us uh, well, will be able to help uh, yeah. make, perhaps to distinguish, like, is this just my own desire? Is this really something coming from, uh, from, from my heart? Barakallahu fikum. Um, we have another question here from uh, Tasneem. Is OCD spiritual possession or could it be a chemical imbalance due to lifestyle? Is it a chemical imbalance? That's more of like neurological, biological thing or Spiritual possession. Spiritual. OCD? As far as I know, OCD still remains something like an anxiety problem. All right? There might be some chemical imbalance here and there, some kind of neurotransmitters from the brain, but still much more classified as an anxiety disorder. And um, how it works, we need to actually examine it. Okay? The cognition, the compulsion, sorry, the compulsion tells you that something needs to be done. Ordinarily, let's even break it down. How do you just get out of your room? You are going to the class and you lock up the door of your hostel and you get halfway and you are like thinking, oh, have I actually locked the door? Right? That's a compulsion. And eventually you, you cognitively recall, right? There is this recall process that confirms with you that you have actually locked the door and you move on, right? 
Okay, but for an OCD patient, the compression comes in so strongly that he feels he has not locked the door, so he has to go back. So he, he confirms by locking the door again, even though he's, he has locked the door and eventually found out that he has, he has locked the door, he goes back. He gets to another part of the road again and goes back. That's as a result of certain anxiety affecting that person. Mm -hmm. As a result of some accumulated stress around that time, and the compulsion eventually leads to certain act, I mean, certain actions to, to, to make that compulsion become practicable. So that affects daily functioning, it affects everything. All right. So generally, OCD is still seen as an anxiety disorder, right? And um, tagging it to be spiritual, yes, it's possible. It's possible. Being gene possessed can make someone to be that anxious. But so far, I've never heard of any of this like compulsion, obsessive symptoms, all right? Or obsessive compulsion symptoms among gene possessed individuals. Right. I've never heard of one, but it's possible, right? It's possible as far as gene possession is concerned. So spiritually, yes, it may be, but there is no confirmation yet on that, as far as I know. At the same time, if it's much more like a chemical imbalance, uh, so far, I'm not sure if there is any, any write-up on this. Maybe if I have to do more research, I'm not sure yet. If it's more, more like, maybe we are targeting it like a neurological disorders, I'm not sure so far. But yeah, it's something we can explore. Something we can explore. But for the fact that OCD affects people, when it becomes a disorder, yes, it's much more connecting to anxiety problems. Thank you. The obsessions is being acted out after a period of time. Thank you, Dr. Salami. And, you know, when we have um, people like yourself, like sharing the actual experiences, um, you know, so I remember Dr. Mustafa Badawi, also a very, you know, well-renowned um, <clears throat> psychiatrist in this field as well and he said you know in the 30 years of his practice as well like maybe maybe one was attributed to gin so it's a lot less common as in your experience as well uh than than what people sometimes imagine sometimes uh you know there's a tendency to try and uh, assume that that it's just gin possession but really like the people who've worked in this field are reminding us that it's actually a lot rarer. So thank you for sharing uh, your experience as well with uh, with OCD patients. Uh, Dr. Salami, I'm mindful of the time we've gone over. Um, if it's okay, we can take maybe one more last question. Okay, no problem. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Um, so this question is also from uh, Brother Amir. In Islamic psychology or spirituality, who is the I? So when I is referred to, is it the nafs, the ruh, the qalb, or the aql? A combination of these or none of these? Um, so far, many Muslim psychologists, Muslim practitioners have been talking about this concept. Um, I try to dissect maybe for much more clear understanding. Like I said in, in, during, the, during the discussion just now, the only element in all this concept that have the physical dimension is the heart, right? Okay, and um, we don't have it inside our body, pumping the, the blood, right? That's our heart. Now we have the spiritual dimension of that same heart. It's being quoted in the Hadith. It's already also in the Quran, right? Now, let's look at the soul. The soul originates when the future gets to four months. And when the angel breathes that 
into the human body, when we have that into the human, it comes with four things. What is going to feed on is, is, I mean, the four things comes with it, right? And the baby keeps developing with that. Yeah, so the baby is already having the soul until it's appointed time, right? In, in life, okay? Now, that's one dimension of the soul. That same soul, when it's being taken out from the body, the body is done. It's taken to the heavens and Allah accepts or rejects, right? Now, that's one dimension of the spiritual soul. Now, we are still also talking about a soul that is being categorized to the level of the struggles, okay? When you put effort into certain spirituality, you elevate yourself to the Lawama level, right? When you are always falling short, you are, you are down there in the Amara level, something like this. So we, we look at the soul purely from the spiritual dimension. We look at the heart also from both physical and spiritual dimension. Uh -huh. And when, when we look at the entire concepts, the cult, the rule, yeah, we, we, we very much connect our understanding to the fact that these elements are the spiritual functioning of our human system, all right? How they work, under which platform do they, you know, exhibits their functioning as we see either in the spiritual world or in our own world. Sometimes we need to, to, to read more and seek more knowledge regarding this because as far as Islamic knowledge is concerned on these concepts, we still need to explore. We still need to explore. Mind you, the same concept of soul, all right, um, as reported in, in the point where the angel is taking it out from the human body. Let's get another understanding from this. The angel is taking it out from the human body. And right here on the earth, the human who is about to depart is seeing an image in the heavens, is seeing an image of his portion in the paradise, all right? Because he's a rightful servant, he's, he's on the good side. And the soul is being taken out by the angels who are, I mean, by the angel of death, accompanied by the, by the good angels, the angels who are very much connected to taking the good soul, all right? And they are taking this soul, they, they, they are going to part the person with, with the mosque and everything from the heavens. And, you know, when, when you look at all this gathered together, we will realize that the soul we're actually talking about has different spiritual dimensions. Now, when I say that, okay, we are, the, the, the soul is going to be taken to the heavens, how is that going to happen? Are we now saying that soul with all spiritual is now being physical, that will be moving up? I mean, it's still like, you know, still looking not so clear to us based on our understanding. Right. But the fact that when we mention the word soul, who has some number of spiritual understandings attached to it. Right. So we, we just need to like widen our understanding and see how well we can connect it to, to the exact human functioning we are talking about, which we, we did broken down to, to, to the levels, right? At least based on Quranic verses, we have these levels. And based on how we, we activate ourselves in terms of our last remembers and everything connecting to that helps us to elevate. And for the fact that we understand we need to keep struggling, to keep polishing, to keep upgrading, to put ourselves in the limelight of something adaptive, right? Something something meaningful um, that, that we always put us in the spectrum of our last members, our last consciousness, for us to attain that, you know, that adaptive functioning. Okay. So, yeah, the concept is so wide. The concept is yeah. so wide. Very dynamic.
Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Salami. Alhamdulillah, this has been a really wonderful and insightful lecture. We really appreciate uh, your time and your sharing your vast knowledge. And uh, we're blessed to have also, you know, sharing your experiences with Dr. Malik Badri, alhamdulillah. And may you continue to walk uh, in his footsteps and, and, and teach us, inshallah. Um, with that, inshallah, I would like to thank uh, Sister Nadira, Sister Brother uh, Shahzad, all of the attendees today uh, for coming. Um, and we would ask Dr. Salami if you could just end with a closing dua, inshallah. <laughs> Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters.